So remember in Nostra Aetate, because we are preparing next year for the 60th anniversary. In October, it will be 60 years since Vatican II, since the proclamation of that document in October 1965. I want to show some images that are absolutely contemporary, very recent, that illustrate perhaps this huge change in attitudes towards our religious other neighbors. This was just a few days ago, Pope Francis in Indonesia. He's now in Papua New Guinea, but there were very, very moving pictures of him with the grand imam of Indonesia, Sheikh Abdul Karim. And uh, because the Pope is very low, because he sits in a wheelchair, uh, the imam was able to kiss him on the head. So, uh, quite impressive. And, uh, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. We're going to start with a musical introduction that comes from the Holy Father's visit to Morocco in 2015. A very impressive visit where he met with the person sitting next to him, who is King Mohammed VI. And during that meeting, they put out a very important document on the city of Jerusalem which is very worthwhile going back to look at. But I'd like to start with something that was presented at that meeting. And in my opinion, it's very, very beautiful, a very beautiful introduction to our discussion. Et c'est maintenant l'Orchestre Philharmonique du Maroc, qui, comme je vous le disais tout à l'heure, spirituel.
So I have watched that over and over and over again. And in the last few months watching it, I've often cried because our world could be like that, and it's not. And I think that the hope that was embodied in Nostra Aetate was that this could become a reality. Of course, extending it to include uh, the believers in all religions and also those who believe in none. So uh, I think it was obvious that when the man walked in, he was uh, reciting the Muslim recitation of faith. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I proclaim, I bear witness that there is no God but God. And then the Jewish woman came in singing the Jewish proclamation of faith, which was Adonai Echad, Eloheinu Echad. Our Lord is one, our God is one. And then, not very symmetrical, the Christian lady came in and sang Ave Maria. Okay, we won't comment on that. <laughs> um, by the way, we'll return to that dissymmetry when we, in three meetings time, the last meeting, we talk about the dialogue with Muslims. Our program today, just so that you have an idea how our morning will look, we will definitely end at 12.30, no later, don't worry. So first of all, I'd like to very briefly give an outline of how we conceived of these three sessions. The three sessions are today, some input on the background and the general structure of Nostra Aetate. That will be the beginning this morning. Then next time we will meet, we will focus on paragraph four of Nostra Aetate, which is the paragraph, the longest in the whole document, and really, in a certain sense, the motor of the document that talks about our dialogue with our Jewish brothers and sisters. Again, then we will have input in the beginning, and then we will have with us a Jewish brother to talk with him, to hear from him, and dialogue with him. Uh, Dr. David Lebinsky. And in three meetings time, which will be at the end of October, we will do the same, same structure, but now taking paragraph three, the dialogue with Muslims. We'll read it closely, get some input before welcoming a Muslim sister who will be uh, Hak Hakima Haithar, who is a collaborator with the Jesuits in JRS. She will be joining, joining up with us to also give us a little bit of input about Muslims, her own Muslim identity, and then we'll have a time for dialogue with her. Okay, that's what these three sessions look like. They are independent, so don't feel that if you hate it today, you're obliged to come next time and tell your friends that if they miss today, they can still come next time. Uh, each one is independent. Um, so we will, in a moment, begin with the input. We will have a coffee break at around half past 10 for about 20 minutes. Before we go out to a coffee break, I will take the liberty, unless someone strongly opposes, of breaking you up into four or five groups. And then we will, can go into discussion groups. There will be questions that will animate those discussion groups. And we will come back then at around quarter to 12 for a concluding session, a short session, looking at the end of the document, but also hearing some feedback from your discussion groups. So in each discussion group, there will be somebody named to be the feedback giver, or whatever that's called in English. Rapporteur. So, okay. Let's look at very briefly background that we need in order to understand what a revolution Nostra Aetate was. So, first of all, I think a statement that many of us will remember from our Catholic lives, no salvation outside the church. And to be perfectly honest, the church is still struggling to formulate uh, a theology that no longer necessarily excludes those outside the church. It's not like everything now is absolutely clear and full of light. And we know, and maybe some people sitting here even, ah, we know that there are still Catholics 
who firmly hold there is no salvation outside the church. Everyone needs to be a baptized member of the Catholic Church to get into heaven. I would say that the church never really held that, but it certainly became a firm belief of many, many Catholics over the centuries, and Nostra Aetate challenges that to a large degree by saying that we should respect those members of other religions, dialogue with them. We have something to say to them, but we have certainly a lot to learn from them. So a new approach. And so how would many see non-Christian religions in the light of no salvation outside the church? I would say that relatively clearly, they would be obstacles to the working out of God's plan. Please come in. Velma, there's a place for you right here in front. <laughs> That's where all the naughty people sit. Welcome. <laughs> so non-Christian religions would then be regarded as a kind of obstacle for God's plan. Of course, I'm not sure that we ever profoundly asked God what God thought of the other religions. But of course, again, uh, it's not 100% resolved, uh, this question of do believers uh, in other religions have a direct access to God that does not pass through the church or pass through Jesus Christ? And these are very complex questions that are still being debated. And of course, there are Catholic theologians out there who have no problem and say, no, no, we're all on the way to God together. And others who would say, no, really, the other religions are definitely problematic, but we do treat the believers in other religions with respect. So complicated issues that we're not necessarily going to get into unless we have a discussion about that in the last part of today. A third theme uh, that very much characterized the Catholicism of the pre-council. We believe that we are sent on mission, all of us are missionaries to a certain extent. We believe that we are called to share our faith. But the big question was, how do we do that? And particularly, what's the link between our religious faith and our culture? So you see that I've taken something from uh, centuries gone by, and this is a bit of self-critique because those are Jesuit missionaries. Let's look at the illustration carefully. Uh, a group of indigenous people, perhaps Africans, but not necessarily, are kneeling in front of the missionaries. And now let's introduce language that we haven't mentioned so far. They are white, European missionaries. And the people kneeling in front of them are non-white and non-European. Notice the non, okay? Not defining people according to how they see themselves, but what they are not in relationship to the culture that has come. And then notice another aspect of this illustration, which is very problematic. There are, of course, the soldiers standing next to the missionaries. It is the conquering state, the colonizing state, that has brought the missionaries. And I'm sure that we're all very aware of these dynamics being here in Africa. Oh, this is a heritage that we are still dealing with. And that is, is Christianity a white person's religion? I'm not sure how many of you have ever seen or remember seeing a film that I remember was banned in South Africa. I think it came out in the 1970s. It was called Black and White in Color. Did anyone ever see that movie? No one. It's a must. It is a must. Ah, it's a movie that takes place. Paul, did you see it? No, no, I saw it banned in the 60s. I would have hoped that it would have come back after 1994, but perhaps it was already forgotten. It is a brilliant a satire on colonialism, but black and white in color. It's the story of two colonies, one next to the other, one dominated by French and the other by German uh, colonial powers. And suddenly, sometime in 1915, we all remember the First World War began in 1914, 
But suddenly in 1915, the newspapers arrive and they learn that actually they're at war. So they go to war. Raymond? Excellent, excellent. Please watch it. It is such a wonderful movie. But I do want to describe one scene from this movie where a man is praying according to his traditional religion in his hut and he hears noise outside. And so the first reaction is he hides all of those things that he's been using according to his traditional religious practice. And then he listens again and he thinks, and he goes out of his hat saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then suddenly he sees that it's the European missionaries, not the Muslim missionaries who arrived. So he runs back into his hut, takes out his cross, puts it on and comes out saying in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, you are welcome, you Mission and culture. Uh, and we are still dealing uh, with the ravages of that confusion between a faith in Jesus Christ who, let us remember, was not a white European. We'll come to that next week, or uh, next time we meet. And uh, our European culture and the imposition of European culture using religion as a tool, not only in Africa, but in Latin America, in North America, in Asia, and everywhere else. And of course, the very problematic theme of religion and state. Uh, I think, but perhaps some will disagree, that we went through an incredible liberation process in 1789. 1789 was the French Revolution. And religion was thrown out of the corridors of power and persecuted. Uh, just the other day, we celebrated a feast of Jesuit martyrs who had been put to death during the French Revolution. But I think it was a liberation to be again free of the power that we had assumed with Constantine back in the fourth century. Uh, Constantine who made the Christian religion legitimate and by the end of the fourth century it had become the religion of the state. And that state used religion in order to impose what the state wanted and many, many different fields. And that included relations with people of other religion that we were now linked to power and so we could impose our structures and relations on people of other religion. So this is some background. And again, I think it's important to remember that in order to realize what a change we are encountering in Nostra Aetate. The things that led to that change, well, the horror, and I've put here of the, of the Second World War, I would say even the First World War, the horrors of the two wars in the 20th century led to the realization that something was profoundly wrong. Many in the Catholic Church after the Second World War started to look for alternative ways of worshiping God that were not linked necessarily to European culture because the feeling was that European culture was bankrupt. And so many, many of those missionaries that had brought European culture to Asia and Africa started to go to Asia and Africa looking for alternative cultures. And that was a very, very powerful movement. We had missionaries going to India and taking on the practices of Hinduism and Buddhism, people going to the Middle East and discovering the world of Islam, people coming to Africa and discovering the wealth of spirituality and traditional religions. And of course, most importantly, after the Second World War, the realization of what Europe had done to the Jews, who were Europeans until the Second World War. And suddenly the Nazis put them out of society and we had the horrific events that we know of as the Shoah. Again, we'll speak more about that next time we meet. Following the Second World War, decolonization, uh, the realization that Europe was for, Euro for Europeans, Africa was for Africans, Asia for Asians, etc., etc., and the withdrawing of those structures of power. The beginning of a very strong anti-racism, uh, an anti-racism that made particularly Christians look at their heritage and how their religion 
had been turned into an ideology. And finally, our enculturation that started to flower at the time of the council and received great support from the council. The term means, of course, as many of us will know, how Christianity, instead of imposing culture, incarnates within the culture into which it is now introduced. So we have uh, some of the wonderful illustrations of enculturation coming out at the time of the council and afterwards, particularly through music, uh, the, the hymns and the celebrations that take on uh, the cultural forms. So again, I'm not mentioning all of the background to Vatican II and Nostra Aetate, but this would certainly be some of the main themes. I'm sure we all recognize those two men at the forefront, both of them now saints. Uh, on the right-hand side, Pope John XXIII, often known as Beloved John, the Beloved Pope. Uh, John XXIII, as big a surprise as Francis, coming to the papacy at an advanced age, no one really thought that he would be the next pope, but elected pope after the very austere papacy of Pope Pius XII and his beaming countenance. Uh, pope Pius XII was a very shy and reserved person, an Italian aristocrat. John XXIII from Bergamo was more close to the peasants, to the people, and he showed that in his attitudes and his words uh, a loving presence. And in a moment, I'll explain a little bit more in detail what I think might be a key word to this Pope who introduced the council, the key word being, being an Italian word, aggiornamento, bringing things up to date. Okay, and again, I think that signifies that openness to the world, because in order to realize that we had fallen behind, you needed to know what was going on in the world. And he was truly a man who loved the world. I hope that sounds like God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world. And the man who succeeded him, uh, who was a little more reserved, a great intellectual, uh, Pope Paul VI, also now canonized. And I would say that the word that characterizes his influence on the emerging document Nostra Aetate would be the word dialogue that has become so central to who we are as Catholics. So John the 23rd. Uh, um, let me try and read. I've just undergone cataract surgery, so I don't know whether to use my glasses, not use my glasses. I'm going to try. Ah, uh, that beautiful icon by John Lenz. We are not on earth to guard a museum, but to cultivate a flourishing garden of life. I think if I gave that, if I made that phrase today, some people would say, oh, that's Pope Francis. But it wasn't. It was Pope John the Twenty-Third. Aggiornamento, as I said, we need to get up to date. Or in other words, and he said something very close to what I'm about to say, it's stuffy in here, open the windows, okay? There's a world out there that is a fascinating world. We have something to say to them, sure, but they have something to say to us as well. Uh, a general attitude. Now, John the Twenty-Third was already a leader in the church during the Second World War, and during the war, he was fully engaged in identifying who was suffering the most. The war years he spent in countries like Bulgaria, Turkey, and France. Very interesting. Bulgaria, a profound meeting with the Orthodox, which would open him to ecumenical dialogue. Turkey, the meeting with the Muslim world. And by the way, the statue in the center is the statue of Pope John XXIII that stands outside the main Catholic cathedral in Istanbul, if anyone has been there. The meeting with the Muslims, but very important. Ah, this is what many Jews said after the war. John the Twenty-Third turned the Nunciatura, the Vatican Embassy, into a printing press. What was he printing? Fake identity papers for Jews to get them out of Europe. And he is regarded as a hero, a huge hero, by the Jewish people. 
and that of course would also have its effect on the writing of Nostra Aetate. Um, in fact, uh, the last point there, uh, after the war, moving up the hierarchy, 1958 becoming Pope, realizing that part of what he was called to do was to convene another council, the Second Vatican Council, I think the 22nd Council of the Church since the beginning, 100 years, uh, uh, less just under 100 years since the convening of the First Vatican Council that had kind of said, we need to preserve our faith. This world is a very threatening place. Vatican II, the spirit of the time, we need to open up. Stuff in here, open the windows, we need to open up. And just before convening the council, he meets with Jules Isaac. Jules Isaac, who would have a profound influence on the document Nostra Aetate. Jules Isaac was a Jewish French historian who had been in the concentration and death camps where he had lost his wife and his children and came out of that experience absolutely convinced that he needed to try and influence the Christian world to change their discourse about Jews, to move from a discourse of contempt, and we'll talk a lot more about that next time we meet, a discourse of contempt to a discourse of respect. Again, he would influence very directly paragraph four, respect for the Jewish people, but beyond what he foresaw, perhaps even what John the 23rd foresaw in 1960 when he met Jules Isaac, that teaching of respect would open up to embrace all the members, all the faithful of other religions. Another saying from John the 23rd, I want to throw open the windows of the church so that we can see out and the people can see in. Again, this spirit of openness. Pope Paul VI, who succeeded John the 23rd, died in 1963. The council was in session. Ah, it started in 1962, it would end in 1965. And Pope Paul VI, again, a more reserved person, but certainly a great intellectual and very much in dialogue with the world, a friend of many of the philosophers and theologians of his time, I came to be Pope, another Italian, Montini, and his decisive contribution would be, and we'll read a few phrases from that in a moment, his encyclical, the first encyclical he sent, uh, Ecclesiam Sua, his church, and that would define the concept of dialogue. Again, much wider than just dialogue in its interreligious meaning, but dialogue that needs to go on as a fun foundational relationship in the church and between the church and the world. Pope Paul VI was the first pope to make an overseas trip during the council. In January 1964, he went to the Holy Land and again very deliberately chose the Holy Land as his first port of visit. He would afterwards go around the world, made a very important visit to India in 1968, but in 1964, he wanted to go to the sources of our faith and visit the land of Jesus, the land of the Bible. And there, of course, he would encounter the Jordanian authorities who ruled who were Muslim. He paid a very quick visit to territories within Israel and encountered the president of the state of Israel. So it would also have that interreligious aspect. One of the great people who influenced enormously uh, uh, Nostra Aetate and was in close relationship with uh, Pope Paul VI was the Frenchman Louis Massignon. Interesting, uh, Jules Isaac, a French uh, Jewish man, deeply engaged in dialogue. Louis Massignon was a French Catholic who eventually became also a married uh, priest in the Greek Catholic Church and had devoted his life to the study of Islam. Uh, he wrote a very, very important detailed biography of a man by the name of Mansur al-Halaj, who was martyred for claiming that in some sense, he was an incarnation of God, 
and tracing these ideas so close to Christian ideas in Islam. Again, a man devoted to dialogue with Islam. Paul VI, his encyclical Ecclesiam Suam, uh, from there, St. Paul VI, it would indeed be a disgrace if our dialogue were marked by arrogance, the use of bad words, or offensive bitterness. And again, he's not only talking about the dialogue with other religions, he's talking about the dialogue with the world, a world that had been kind of shunned at the First Vatican Council. Again, two other phrases, how vital it is for the world and how greatly desired by the Catholic Church that the two should meet together and get to know and love one another. A new language, a language of dialogue. And from uh, paragraph 65, the Church must enter into dialogue with the world in which it lives. So let's look a little briefly at the document itself that we'll be spending these meetings uh, remembering and getting to know better. The document, as I say, was published in October 1965 at the end of the Council. It's made up of five paragraphs, an introduction, which we're going to read in detail, word for word, in a moment. And at the end of the day, we will come together to conclude by reading Again, in detail, paragraph five. In case you're getting fidgety, they're very short paragraphs. Don't worry. Okay. Then in, on the 26th of October, we will dedicate a meeting to paragraph three, the Muslims. And on the 5th of October, we will de dedicate a paragraph, a, a meeting to paragraph four, which focuses on the Jews. That's the longest paragraph. And that is very, very significant. Okay, and paragraph two, which I'm afraid I can't say much about, but we'll be happy to hear someone here who can say a lot more about it. I encourage you to read it. Again, a brief paragraph that talks about the Catholic attitude to traditional religions. Very, very important here in Africa and very important in South Africa. And Hinduism and Buddhism, the Hindu community is the largest of the communities when compared with Muslims and Jews in South Africa. So again, a very important paragraph which we're omitting because of my own ignorance. Okay, before we have our break and before we divide up into groups to deal with some questions that will be asked to face, I would like to read slowly with some commentary, paragraph one, the introduction to Nostra Aetate. Nostra Aetate means in Latin, in our time. Okay, and so you see there that that is also the first words of the document. In our time, when day by day humankind is being drawn closer together and the ties between different peoples are becoming stronger, the church examines more closely her relationship to non Christian religions. Again, from this document to God's ears, may it be reality. A little word of warning, if you went to look at these documents on the internet, they won't sound exactly as they sound in my rewriting of them, because I've tried to make them inclusive. I've tried to insert inclusive language. We continue. In her task of promoting unity and love among human beings, indeed among nations, she considers above all in this declaration what humans have in common and what draws them to fellowship. Again, remember, this is a document that's going to be talking about our attitude towards Hindus, Buddhists, traditional religions, Muslims, Jews, we will see that right through how we really focus on what we have in common that draws us into fellowship. I will say that there has been criticism of Nostra Aetate and that has been developed in later documents. And what do we do where we differ? When we don't have in common, that is certainly a very important part 
of relationship. But I think that the fathers of the council felt very strongly that after centuries where we focused on difference, which led to a teaching of contempt, the time was now in the 60s to focus on what we have in common. And what's interesting is that this document, Nostra Aetate, can draw on very little of church tradition. The other documents, you have half a page of text and half a page of footnotes of all the teachings of the church that are quoted that really underline the message of the document. Nostra Aetate really had to search long and hard to find precedents, but for this there is a precedent. And I'd like to just mention it because maybe somebody would like to go and have a look. In this second century, particularly in the second century, the early church theologians, the church fathers, I'm thinking particularly of people like St. Justin Martyr, Irenaeus of Lyon, Tertullian, they were very much faced with the issue of what do they do with these huge religious systems that they are surrounded by that we, a little bit with disrespect, called pagan systems. What do they do with them? How do they interrelate with them? And so Justin was the first, and this was developed afterwards, developed an idea that was God sows God's seed throughout the world. And that seed can be found everywhere. There is an example, a very beautiful example in the Acts of the Apostles. In chapter 17, St. Paul arrives in Athens and he speaks to the Athenians saying, I have walked among your idols and I found one called a God unknown. That is the God that you have been worshipping. That is our God, the God of Jesus Christ. Okay, again, it was this approach to open ourselves. In Paul's case, perhaps not to a dialogue with the religions, but at least to finding value in other religious systems. So there was something to be said there. The document continues. One is the community of all peoples, one their origin. For God made the whole human race to live over the face of the earth. One also is their final goal, God. God's providence, God's manifestations of goodness, God's saving design extend to all of humanity until that time when the elect will be united in the holy city. The city ablaze with the glory of God, where the nations will walk in God's light. Again, notice. Uh, a church that has, in some sense, traditionally distant itself from the world, creating a kind of division. Here, the search is for unity, for that oneness, which is again biblically inspired from the book of Genesis. God created one human person from which we are all, from whom we are all descended that oneness of humanity. Again, let's already put it up front. There will be those who say, but is that oneness not uniform? Are we talking about some kind of oneness that equals uniformity, where we were all the same? Because our real challenge is to deal with diversity. And again, as the church continues to reflect on Nostra Aetate and its heritage, that question will come up, up time and time again. How do we deal with difference? How do we deal with diversity? But I think when the document was published, there was really a need to insist that at the end of it, we are all one family, descended from one uh, couple, Adam and Eve. And so, the last paragraph of this introduction, human beings expect from the various religions answers to the unsolved riddles of the human condition, which today, even as in former times, 
deeply stir the hearts of, sorry, a man escaped me there, deeply stir the hearts of humanity. Oh, sorry, hearts of men and women. I added the word, sorry. <laughs> men and women. I don't need to feel guilty. What is the human person? What is the meaning, the aim of our life? What is moral good? What is sin? When suffering and what purpose does it serve? Which is the road to true happiness? What are death, judgment and retribution after death? What finally is that ultimate inexpressible mystery which encompasses our existence? Whence do we come and where are we going? Now, again, this shows something very, very significant in the general formulations of the Council. We would call this, from an academic point of view, an anthropological paragraph. It begins with the human person, the needs of the human person, the search of the human person. This was a turning point at the Council, when many realized that our theology had always begun with speculations about God. Pretending to write our theology from the perspective of a God who looks down, and of course we are those chosen instruments of that God talk theology. At the Council, theologians like the Jesuit Karl Rahner, uh, the uh, Dominican Skillebecks, and many, many others, started to say, we are not capable of writing theology from the perspective of God. We are human beings with these kind of questions. And this also brings us all together. Whether we are believers or not believers, whether we are Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, or following any religious system, we share this questioning. Uh, this questioning which can be summed up in where, from where do we come and where are we going? Again, bringing us into a dialogue on these questions. So, I'll stop there. Are there any comments, uh, questions? We'll take only a short time now. We'll have a long time in the concluding session. We will continue these themes, hopefully on the 5th of October, which will be the discussion of Nostra Aetate, paragraph 4, focusing specifically on the relationship with the Jewish people. By the way, I point out that it is also an auspicious day because it is the 3rd of Tishrei, meaning it's the third day of the new year. Jews would have celebrated on the Thursday and Friday, Rosh Hashanah, the celebration of the new year. And again, we will continue even further on the 26th of October when we devote this session to relationships with Muslims. And again, both times we will have a Jewish friend and a Muslim friend coming to give some kind of personal testimony and enter into dialogue with us. So in order to conclude, I'd like to read uh, the final paragraph of Nostra Aetate, and I've asked Raymond to pay particular attention so that perhaps he can maybe illuminate us a little with a thought on how this ties up with another very important document of the Church on uh, freedom of conscience. Again, the Catholic Church has not always had a wonderful record respecting freedom of conscience, the dignity of every human person and their rights that come to them because they are human beings and not because they are the member of some community. So, if you'll take up that challenge at the end. Just a moment or two at the end. Okay, so let's read it. We cannot truly call on God, the Father of all, if we refuse to treat in a fraternal way any person created as he or she is in the image of God. The human person's relation to God the Father 
and his or her relation to others, their brothers and sisters, are so linked together that scripture says, the one who does not love does not know God. Again, I just point out in this short commentary on each of the sections that this paragraph is opening a parenthesis with the citation from the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 8, that it will close with that same citation. Again, the emphasis in the final, beyond unity, love, are the relationships of love. No foundation therefore remains for any theory or practice that leads to discrimination between one person and another, or people and people, so far as their human dignity and the rights flowing from it are concerned. Again, a huge discussion in the church and a very interesting discussion. Is the source of this teaching, which again is a revolution in the language of the church, as we know the church through the centuries, is the root of this teaching, as the church is claiming, in biblical discourse? Remember Genesis? God created one human couple from whom we are all our descendants, and therefore we are one family. Does it come from there, or does it come from the Universal Declaration on, on the Rights of the Human Person, uh, United Nations, or going back to the French Revolution? Again, I'm always cautious when we as Christians claim some kind of religious, uniquely religious inspiration, because it makes us real dumbos that we didn't see it through all the centuries if it was always there. So I think that we need to credit the world with teaching us something about the inherent dignity of the human person and the rights that devolve from their humanity. And the final paragraph, we cannot truly, on God, truly call on God the Father of all if we refuse to treat in a fraternal way any person created as they are in the image of God. The human person's relation to God the Father and his or her relation to others, their brothers and sisters, are so linked together that scripture says, the one who does not love does not know God. It's almost a re repetition, again, to drive home uh, the message that Nostra Aetate is promoting and hoping will install itself in our hearts. So again, we will continue this discussion focusing on paragraph four next time, paragraph three the time after, and then if by the will of God somebody appears who can lead us through a meditation also on paragraph two, are Hindus, Buddhists, <coughs> traditional religions, that would be a welcome addition to this series. So Raymond, if you want to say something. So as we were saying earlier, this document, Nostra Aetate, is one of the last set of documents that comes out of Vatican II um, between October and December of uh, 1965. And one of the very last documents is the one on freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, known as Dignitatis Humanae. So it starts, it puts its, very much puts its, uh, uh, its message uh, on, in the title, The Dignity of the Human Person. Um, and as David pointed out, that's equally a revolutionary statement for the church, having for so long fought for, not for the rights of religious freedom, but rather the rights of the Catholic Church and the rights of the Catholic Church over and against others. Uh, and clearly there's all kinds of interesting historic shifts where the Catholic Church finds itself not in a majority situation, but in a mi minority situation, and recognizing that opposing religious freedom in order to protect Catholics in majority Catholic countries then puts Catholics at a disadvantage in situations where they're not in a majority. And of course, many of you will have experienced what that was like in South Africa and the Rumsa Gafar and that whole sense of, of what status Catholics had here. What I find really interesting, it's lovely to see, to look at paragraph five again and to see the connections between the two. Remember, all these documents are easily available online. Unfortunately, as David says, most of them don't. There isn't an inclusive translation, but you can, 
you can adjust for that in your in your own heads. Uh, when you read this and you read um, Dignitatis Humanae, also a relatively short document, you see this recurrent language of the image of, uh, of all of us being born in the image and likeness of God. Um, and what we see through those and also through the document on the, uh, the uh, pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, Hope and Joy, we see a recurrent understanding that when we start with the human person, there is nothing that should divide us. And all of these things that divide us are a, are, are a failure, are sinful, um, because they are against God's, God's wish for us. So clearly the document on religion is looking at that in the context of religious difference. The doc document on ecumenism is looking at that in the, con in the context of differences uh, within the Christian traditions. But also we see a complete repudiation of any kind of exclusion on the basis of race. We see uh, the beginnings, and really only the beginnings, of an understanding of how that then applies to gender. There's no hint in any of these documents about issues around LGBTQ issues, but we can look at those issues through the same lens and we see that there is a there is a continuous thread here. So one of the things which strikes me when, when we were having those discussions earlier and people are saying, oh, I'm not really sure I've chatted to many Jews or I've chatted to many Muslims, the same question applies. How often have I had a conversation with somebody from a different racial background? How often have I had a conversation with somebody with a different sexual orientation? How often have I had a conversation with somebody uh, from a different nationality? Because it's only in those conversations that we discover what we have in common and discover that what, what we have that's different need not to divide us. That diversity doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't necessarily mean division. And that, that challenge to dialogue, which is in this document, which is in uh, Dignitatis Humanae and is, and is the absolute core of Gaudium et Spes, is something which 60 years on, we've only just begun to do. Um, and certainly in my work, one of the things which, which we really hope to, to get across to people is that when homeless people come to us and refugees come to us, they are seeing people in the image and likeness of God. And it doesn't matter how hard you work to feed people or provide healthcare or do any other thing, the practical things, if you do not see that person as having the same worth in God's eyes as you do, then you cannot call yourself a Christian because that is the fundamental demand that is made on all of us as, uh, as Christians. So I, f I find these documents, uh, those of you who were part of the Hope and Joy exercise a few years ago know that uh, uh, some of us get quite obsessed about Vatican II documents. They are brilliant. They are fantastic. They're mostly quite short. They're mostly very readable. And 60 years on, they can so nourish our faith and, 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 and motivate us not just to reflect deeper, but then to go out into the world and do stuff, because that's what Vatican II encourages us to do. Oh, and so I had one other comment I wanted to make. Sorry, I mentioned Harvey Cox earlier. So when you have these conversations with people about uh, reaching out to people of other faiths and, and you're speaking to a Catholic or a fundamentalist Christian or, so, or, or, or uh, somebody who is opposed to this, what they will always quote back at you is that quote from John's Gospel, uh, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's used as, as almost like the, uh, the, decisive, the decisive quote. So there's a great uh, American theologian of interfaith dialogue called Harvey Cox from Harvard. And he makes a very interesting point. He says, yes, of course, that's an important uh, quote and we mustn't ignore it. And the people who are engaged in interreligious dialogue usually count with another quote from John, which is, my father's house has many mansions. And the point he makes is those two verses are almost side by side in the text, they're almost side by side. He says, God is saying something very important to us, which is that both of those scriptures are important. And we have to find a way to live with both of those. And if we move too far in one direction or too far in the other, we are compromising the, uh, the full set of scripture. So he says, it's, don't, don't be surprised if it's hard to resolve this, because those two quotations seem to be pulling us in different directions. And actually that is, a, that is perhaps a healthy tension and accept that and acknowledge that and work with that tension and don't try to resolve it too far one way or the other because you've probably got it wrong if you do so.